Greetings, my name is Rick and welcome to all the audio coverage from a blog to watch for everything that's going on in and around Watches and Wonders, Time to Watches and all the other brands that are just pitching up on hotels in Geneva to speak to us about their watches. We have interviews galore for you, so hopefully you're going to enjoy the one that's just about to pop up and if you do, then subscribe to everything else on the Spending Time channel and search for a blog to watch weekly on your podcaster for all the news and reviews of the watches that you're about to hear about in these interviews. Enjoy. Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the blog to watch. I'm here in London interviewing Mr. Chris Granger, the CEO of IWC. Chris, welcome. Hey Ariel, thank you for having me. Today you have officially launched the latest generation Ingenieur, probably the closest homage to the original from Gerald Genta. In your words, why a return to the Ingenieur right now and why the Gerald Genta iconic version? Yeah, I think it starts, you know, when you look back in our history, you know, the Ingenieur has quite a colorful history starting from the mid 1950s. However, we are very lucky that the 1832 of 1976 is one of the original free Genta integrated steel watch bracelet uh, watches in the sports segment that defined that design trend. And for us, you know, me with a design and architectural background, it was a, such an exciting period to see this change between classical expression in industrial design and product design. And then suddenly you have this space age forward looking inspiration where everything is possible and it was all about the infinite and all about dynamics and speed and things looking slick and beautiful. And it revolutionized the approach to so many categories, including watchmaking. And suddenly you had this transition from classical gold complication watches that were extremely classical to something which was radical, made in steel, a non-precious material, but still being a premium mechanical watch. And then you have this integrated bracelet. It, it's looking hard wearing, it's looking sporty. And for the first time you were showing exposed construction elements such as the screws and bezels and you know the, this the, it was no longer about hiding it all away it was about a clear expression of design and that i think sits very well with our sort of a little bit germanistic kind of um, engineering approach at iwc where we say it is this purity of form this purity of engineering that ultimately hopefully creates a product that stays relevant and beautiful for a long, long time. And that's really why we picked up that original Genta DNA and developed it now over the last five years and now presenting that new generation, as you say, as a close homage, but still a contemporary sports watch. I want to set the stage here a little bit more for people that are, are just learning about the story because there's so many nuances. You alluded to some of them. There's the Ingenieur name. There's the Gerald Genta era of the Ingenieur. There's what's been happening since then with the Ingenieur. And then there's, of course, the market conditions of today, where these integrated uh, steel bracelets, are not always steel, of course, but these integrated uh, you know, sportier bracelet, yes. watches are very popular and chic. And I think what's important to say that I want people to know is that IWC did not just take this original design and, and emulate it. Other companies have done that. They say, hey, this is the exact same as the one from 1960 or 70 or whatever. That's not what you did. You had to do something much, much harder. Let's be frank, some of the originals would not necessarily do well today in their, in their particular shape or their particular size. Yeah. You had to do something where you took the, the essence of it yeah. and actually make a brand new watch which has never existed in any form that sort of looks like it came from that era but made for today, but you had, you had to make a brand new watch. I think that's so important to say. You're not yeah. just sort of making a replica of an original. No, you're absolutely right. And I think this is uh, uh, the hardest of all exercises because as designers, we like to do new things. So, you know, you, you, to do something completely new is, is straightforward and there's hardly ever any reference uh, a framework where it's going to be judged against. Or you do a faithful replica. That moment where you say, I want to distill the essence of something into a contemporary and forward looking watch is the hardest part for sure. But I think it's trying to understand what was at the core of the thinking and translating this into proportions and into detailing and finishing that is relevant to the taste of today and then hopefully create something that has a longevity in it that can live for years and years to come in different versions and still always feel contemporary. And that you know, timeless design at the end of the day is not something you can force in a process, not something you can force on a Monday morning you can hope that it happens and you can create the conditions for it. And I think this is our job as, as guardians of the brand and as designers to give the best spaces as we possibly can. 
The Ingenieur name started in the 1950s as IWC's Engineer Watch. It was anti-magnetic. Yeah. This is sort of the same era where the Rolex Milgauss came out and there were some other anti-magnetic watches because at the time, you know, these sort of like uh, extremely high sophistication engineering jobs often had time around magnetic fields. And the whole idea is you need to have a reliable watch. And this is, this is a great story because there was a functional reason. It wasn't like a, a, a lifestyle watch. It wasn't, you know, like just a, a fun watch to wear at parties. Mm. But this is supposed to be a real watch that you could wear in these types of conditions. Today, obviously, things are a little bit different. But how do you connect this, this sort of heritage of a functional object? You're mm. obviously into technique. Yep. How do you marry this into a watch which is, you know, a, a, a luxury item. Yeah, I think this is the, the beauty of the category of mechanical luxury watches is that you often, um, we try to achieve this duality and it is clear that the product today is an emotional product, it's an expressive product, it is something that is part of identifying what you stand for, it's self-expression, it's a luxury, it's for enjoyment. But at the same time, I think in our DNA, most of these watches, like the Portuguese or the Pilots or the Ingenieur, go back to a very functional pure tool watch purpose in a sense, whether it's a navigation watch, whether that's a pilot's watch, or whether it's indeed an anti-magnetic watch that was to be worn around this huge increase of electronic and electrical equipment that created these magnetic fields back in the day that had the basic requirement that as an engineer and scientist, and whatever you're doing at the time, you always needed to be able to rely on a precise uh, time indication on your wrist. And even though today, whether you have dive computers and diving watches, whether you have sophisticated electronic navigational equipment and boats and, and of course the avionics and aircraft, there is still this anchor point where you say, if it all goes wrong and if we go off grid and if everything else fails, a pilot's watch from IWC is the ultimate backup navigation tool which would do a job. And we, we often have these discussions around, you know, the, the latest cutting edge aircraft with all the most modern equipment. Yes it's mostly expression and sentimental value why these pilots wear these watches. But if it all goes wrong, and we had a beautiful episode with Matt Jones where you know, all of his modern navigation suite in the Spitfire failed and he was doing an aerobatic display and he actually used his running chronograph to actually determine how he's gonna get to that rendezvous point to start the aerobatic display in the wow. Spitfire. So if push comes to shove, it will still do its job. And I think that is when we talk about form and technique that you know, it has not been removed to a point where it only is a symbol of something. At the heart of it, even though in 99.9% of cases you're going to need it today, it will still do its job. Now, that's a message which, of course, resonates well once you know it. Mm. You have done such a good job with making the current collection of IWC watches design lovers objects. What are the next steps in terms of communication? How is the average person out there going to start to hear about something? So obviously I have my job. Yes. But it's also a very visual experience. You know, we do yeah. storytelling and we cover the watches. But, you know, a lot of people think about this wonderful era of advertising messaging from IWC. Yeah. You have a great heritage of saying some bold uh, statements, some intelligent statements. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they see things like the Ingenieur, they remember yeah. some of these eras. Is, is there something to be said about bringing back some of the, the personality of Absolutely. these types of marketing campaigns? Absolutely. No, I, I mean, uh, as you said correctly, you know, I think in, in, in the seeding phase and reestablishing that, a lot of it will be done through the personal interaction, our network, a lot of it will be happening through our boutiques. But at the same time, we have a, a teaser campaign, which uh, at the time we're, we're airing this, uh, has already happened where, where we are replying um, to a lot of the comments on social media from years past saying bring back the engineer and we're actually replying with a date code for the 27th of March to say look it, it, something is happening. Oh that's fun. And then we're actually using a, a launch campaign window where we have a retro futuristic want to be retro advertising using some of this sort of a uh, quite unique and distinctive messaging that takes you back to the time when advertising had quite a different style of writing and explaining benefits. And today, whether you look at vintage car ads or things that you'd find in a National Geographic magazine from 1970 something, it, it's a very different way of talking about the functional and emotional benefits of products. And I think that there, there is a, a, a humoristic side where you can bring some of that back to show how a no-nonsense watch 
that has functional value back in the day it would have been positioned which is quite different from the motivations why people buy these watches today but it's nice to connect it back to <laughs> what, what they, actually they very, uh, drove they the existence. They were very attention grabbing. Yeah, yeah A lot sure. of luxury advertising yeah. today is sort of like visible Acceptable. but mm. also looks like it doesn't care whether or not you look at it. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like some v very well dressed person who's out in public but also doesn't seem to care if they want attention mm -hmm. and I think the luxury industry has fallen to that whereas that era you're talking about it was it was okay to say hey look at me yeah. I got a fun message for you yeah, yeah, yeah. and consumers like that because especially in the social context it added dimension to them wearing that mm. because people remember like oh I remember all those IWC ads and when they see the watch and they see the name and yeah. I, I just feel that that's so good now because you have so many people in the social media generation that know about luxury watches young people like never before but I think that you and I agree we want them to associate a little bit more than that's expensive with the watch yeah because that's not the emotion that we want to engender right like, it's true but it's not the only emotion we want to engender no like so it's, it's one element of it I mean when you think about these uh, you know the, the ads you're, you're referring to they, they also try to create an image of what sort of person you are going to be if you buy yourself into a certain product world and into a certain brand um, and I think you know the, these images, especially in the men's segment of masculinity and what it means to be successful, etc. They've obviously evolved over time, and quite rightly so. Um, but at the same time, I think you, you're right. You know, to to create um, a, a reference frame of identification that is more than, as you say, just okay, it's status and it's an expensive watch, and everybody will recognize it is very important. You see that a lot. I think today you see that also across fashion in a lot of the collaborations as well, that the collaborations, yes, it's the, the aggregation of brand names, but it's also to bring a background story to a type of design influence that people can relate to and have a deeper experience than just going back to the obvious product and say, oh, this is what I'm wearing because everybody knows what it is. And I think that there is that element. And we, we, we try to bring that with this almost kind of quirky idea of saying, look, there was a time when engineers were the cool thing, you know, it's a cool group to, to develop these things that make our life faster, better, more effortless. We could go on holiday everywhere, you know, space, we can do all these things thanks to engineers and they're the shapers. And that's, that's kind of encapsulated in these watches a bit. I love it, I, I want to see that. We're almost out of time. The last thing I want to ask is talk a little bit about the, the near future of the engineer collection. Uh, you are launching with three steel models yeah. and maybe some other special ones this year. Yeah. Um, I think people are going to want to know how hard is it going to get this? What percentage of the, of the production is this going to be? I guess the simple, the simple question is now that the Ingenieur is relaunched, how big of a focus is it going to be in the larger product collection? Look, I think we, we have the legacy of three of our families, especially the, the Portuguese pilots in Portofino, which are in terms of design DNA are strap watches or multi-accessory watches that today of course exist on bracelet, exist on straps, so various have quick change system, all the rest of it. But their design is very much defined by the watch head first and foremost. I think the Ingenieur is the first sculpturally flowing integrated steel sports watch or metal sports watch that really is a whole that fills a different category. So it will have its focus to build on the elements we don't naturally bring in the other families. So there will be this differentiation. And of course now we want to center this design in what it essentially stands for, which is an automatic date watch in steel and titanium, I think we can say that, as an integrated metal sports watch. And then to build the collection from there, be it in function, be it in diameter, be it in material, uh, but really to start on that anchor point. Chris Granger, CEO of IWC, thank you so much for speaking to us. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with the Blog to Watch, and I'm sitting with the Chief Design Officer of IWC, Mr. Christian Knopp. Christian, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So, we've been talking a lot about the new IWC engineer, and of course, Gerald Genta, that had a big role in, in the engineer, even though he didn't invent the engineer, this was a name that was part of IWC before. Um, and then in the 1970s, uh, he created a version of, of the engineer. And now in 2023, you're bringing back the engineer. It hasn't been the first time. And I think it's a very interesting exercise. And you as the designer, I guess the first question is, what does Gerald Genta mean to you? No, for me, Gerald Genta uh, not only designed a watch for us. I mean, he, he as a person was the 
was a kind of, of hero and, and uh, representation of the profession of a watch designer. Because other than in other industries, like in furniture design, car design, where all the, the big designer names were present, even back in the 70s, in the watch industry, uh, everyone knew the watchmakers, but the designers pretty much worked under the radar. And Gelgenda gave a face to these people, shaping actually the aesthetics of brands, shaping the collections, and, 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 and doing what designers do to, to uh, yeah, to, to create the future of a brand in, in the manifestation of watches. What did Gerald Genta do so well? I mean, he wasn't the only one designing watches, but he's remembered very fondly. His designs are original. But as a designer, what, what can you say in your words as to what it is that he has done well, especially speaking to non-design professionals? I mean, for me, there's, there's basically two things. A, he, he was the design master of a completely new category of watches. The integrated sports watches, which were watches with automatic movements, uh, steel cases with steel bracelets, waterproof. This was sports and leisure watches, which formed a new category in the 60s and 70s and he was definitely the master of designing them. The whole integrated bracelet uh, sports watches, he was mastering in his iconic designs. He did for IWC, but also for a couple of other big names. But second, he, what he designed for us with the engineer was more than a single watch, but it was a watch with a, with a design identity and a character, you would say DNA, design DNA these days, that was so strong and powerful that it would influence the generations of the engineer watches to come in the decades after. At the time of the 1970s, there was an interesting trend of taking steel watches, giving them these sophisticated bracelets, you know, very interesting types of shapes and machining that really hadn't been done before, in lieu of gold, which is easier to machine. Can you explain a little bit about what this fascination was with steel versus precious metals like gold in this 1970s era. Yeah, I think this 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 was not a not a not a free choice back then because this was very much influenced by the market and the rising gold prices. So companies like RWC they were really struggling and the the collections of many watch brands at the time consisted of predominantly gold watches and then the prices in the early 70s suddenly tripled because of the raising gold prices. So they um, they needed creativity, they needed new designs and new materials to, to build watches. And uh, this is not just doing the same design, uh, what you did in gold before, now in steel, but you really had to invent a new category. You had to invent the luxury steel watch. Because you couldn't charge steel prices and you couldn't charge then gold prices. You had to have a watch at the old gold prices, but not in gold. That's what it kind of seems like. Basically, yes. Interesting. And that legacy has now left us with these very fancy steel watches, which are basically saying, we know it's in steel, but look how crazy it is. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we still love today, right? Yeah, and, and this is what we try to express also in the way we, we talk about the engineer and the whole design era. It was a very progressive design. It was not just replacing the same design you had in gold before in steel but really finding a, a aesthetic code, a visual code, that would really underpin this era of, of progressive, forward-looking design. The engineer name is brilliant. It began as a product for engineers, and there's a wonderful romance to it. And over you know, the, the decades, really, IWC has come back to this design and reinvented it in, in many ways, which is sort of unparalleled, because if you think about the market right now, most of these legacy names have more or less been the same type of watch, whereas the engineer has really been different types of watches. Um, what can you say about the internal IWC cultural conversation about the engineer? How is it discussed in comparison to, of course, the pilot and the Portuguese and all that? Like, what is the internal personality of the engineer in general? You know, I think that there's two elements uh, there. The engineer is pretty much a perfect representation of what IWC stands for in terms of approach to engineering and forward-looking design. 
and uh, therefore it is, it's very close to the brand DNA and the brand culture. But other than the examples you are referring to, for us the Ingenieur collection doesn't have the same commercial relevance. We have three very strong collections uh, with pilots Portuguese and Portofino that represent the majority of our turnover. So the Ingenieur really is important in terms of storytelling, in terms of representation of the brand, but doesn't have the, the same commercial relevance like with a couple of other brands which, which really made their, their designs from that era their number one uh, sales uh, products. You know, as a product, the Ingenieur today looks very different than the other types of watches currently sold in the IWC collection. And we know that a big part of design today is also brand identity. Talk a little bit about, from a brand identity standpoint, what is it you're trying to do with the Ingenieur that the collection was lacking before? Because IWC has these incredible iconic designs. You're now introducing a new shape. How do you want that to better flesh out not just the collection, but the brand personality. No, but in terms of brand personality, this very pure, reduced and technical design of the Ingenieur sits perfect in the, in the overall portfolio. But it's also as a product truly complementary to what we have in the other collections. While Pilots, Portofino and Portuguese are predominantly collections that are strap watch collections, also historically. We offer some bracelets, but still the, the product character is basically a strap watch. We, we really believe that this steel on steel, steel bracelet watch sits nicely and complementary in our product portfolio. And especially for the size to have a very variable, small premium steel on steel uh, sports watch, it's complementary what we have to offer in the, in the other collections. It's kind of interesting because sitting here at this event, you see this funny contrast between this beautiful 40 millimeter wide, very sort of cosmopolitan watch, and then everyone is wearing their, you know, their big pilot or some version of the big pilot. And I love it, right? Because these are two very different products for very different people. In your opinion, how does a brand speak to different types of consumers at the same time? So this is going to be sometimes difficult in the modern era with watch brands. But IWC especially has these different families that you could argue speak to very different types of consumer groups. And from a d design perspective, what does that make you think about? What are, what are some of those uh, interesting challenges and opportunities there? I mean, we, we partly speak to different consumers, but not always. Partly also the same consumer who enjoys actually this variety within the same brand, who enjoys to wear a, a big pilot one day and the ingenieur on the other day. But what is, what is beautiful, especially with a 40 millimeters watch like the, the Ingenieur, is that's a product that is not only more variable because of its size, but it's also very open to, to women. It's a kind of complete gender fluid product also in its offer. And this is where we see a lot of opportunities actually in, in various regions and markets. The, the latest version of the Ingenieur has really good proportions and size. And when you look at some of the other generations, you can see where they wouldn't have necessarily passed today's muster, right? The, 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 the requirements to be a perfectly proportioned watch today are higher than they may have ever been. Talk a little bit about what you and your team were doing across this five years, where basically you were taking something that everyone agrees was nice, but you're really trying to get it right. What was that like for you? I think uh, the, the proportions were really one of the main criteria we put as a, as a kind of KPI from the very beginning. So if we want to re redo the Genta Ingenieur, we have to have a very variable product in the end. I mean, this was the learning from all the previous generations. It needs to be recognizable, but it is a, it's a Genta design, but it needs to be very variable. Let's do not everything, but really focus on the essence of the product and get a, get a base product to start with, which is absolutely no compromise in terms of, of ergonomics. And uh, this is also where we actually spent the most time in the development, really getting the proportions right. So we made an endless series of, of, of different prototypes in, in plastic, in metal, uh, to get the case proportions, the whole transition from the case into the bracelet right, the bracelet execution, discussions about the right clasp or buckle that fits exactly this very understated, very slim 
uh, execution of the engineer. Where do you go from here, right? Because you are now taking a design and you want to do executions on it. We look at the pilot and we see all the interesting things you've done, different colors, sizes, materials. Are you already thinking about where to take the engineer or are you alternatively saying, let's release this, see what people like, and then I have some ideas, but then we'll figure out where to go. How far ahead are you thinking? You know, it's both. Obviously, with designers, with development team, we are very excited about the product, so we have plenty of ideas and, and pre-studies where we could take this collection in future. On the other hand, we clearly said, okay, we, we don't want to launch a huge collection, we don't want to plaster the world with, with engineer billboards, uh, but we take a different approach this time. So we gave, go very carefully, very selective in the distribution of this very small compact collection. So taking a, a different approach with a more subtle way of, of communicating, so no billboards on an engineer, going very selectively through our own boutiques and targeting a community that is very IWC minded in first instance. This can be our own collectors, customers, aficionados, but also yeah, this IWC minded people that are asking for, for the relaunch of that engineer since many, many years. So we want to win this community in the first instance and use these people as, as ambassadors, as amplifiers to extend the success of the collection in future and then maybe also extend the product offer. Last question, IWC makes a variety of products different price points and that's great because you can appeal to different people. And the engineer has come in at a variety of different price points. Speaking to collectors out there, help them identify who the engineer is best for. Who are you aiming for? Obviously the price point is, is, a, is a clue, but what types of wearers right now do you think would most enjoy wearing the new engineer? No, I think it's, it's exactly that, that type of people who, who enjoy the purity, a little bit this, this technical reduced appeal that, that uh, the IWC Schaffhausen brand stands for and people that look for very versatile watch that, that uh, they can wear in business, that they can wear in, in sports and leisure and brings that, that understatedness uh, together in a single product that is a good representation of uh, what IWC does different than, than many other brands. Christian Knopp, Chief Design Officer at IWC, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for listening to this interview. Please subscribe to the Spending Time channel and subscribe to a blog to watch weekly for all our weekly news and reviews content from the gang at a blog to watch. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.